If you didn't know it already, Physics Paper 2 on Friday will contain some graphs. So we're going to look at some questions today based around motion graphs. Um, now, just as a quick recap, distance time graphs, the uh, straight line, the gradient, uh, change in y over change in x represents the speed, because speed equals distance divided by time. In this case, it's a constant speed. It could also be curved, uh, which would mean you draw a tangent at a point and find the gradient of that line to find the speed. Uh, now, you need to be careful with these questions, because if it's velocity on the y-axis, um, then the straight line, the gradient, doesn't represent speed it represents acceleration okay so in this case um, it's a straight line so the acceleration we'd say is constant um, however it could be curved as well as you draw a tangent just like previously now also from a velocity time graph you need to know the area underneath the graph uh, is equal to the distance traveled okay this could be a triangle in which case you do half base times height could be a curve could be whatever uh, but make sure you keep an eye on the axis so you know what you can calculate um, now, as well as this, there's highly likely to be some graph questions where you need to describe a graph. Um, so please avoid saying things like the line does this or the graph does that. Mention what's on the y-axis. In this example, it's the velocity um, that would increase um, at a constant gradient or a constant rate initially where it's straight. Then we'd say um, it uh, increases at a decreasing rate until it reaches a constant speed. So let's have a look at some exam questions. The trickier ones you could be asked about graphs in paper too. In paper two uh, is very common for motion graphs such as velocity time graphs and distance time graphs uh, to come up in one way, shape or form. Uh, so let's have a look at this question. Um, now it's got a velocity time graph of a car up at 30 and it gradually decreases um, a period of time. And the question asks us to work out the braking distance of the car. Okay, so there's a couple things we can work out from velocity time graphs. Um, and one of them is that the distance can be given, found by working out the area underneath the graph okay now the reason for that um, is because whenever you multiply uh, two axes together so in this example velocity and time um, you can find that out by working underneath it now this is even trickier because instead of being a relatively straightforward uh, rectangle or even a triangle would be easier and uh, this is a curve okay now how we do it is essentially by estimating by counting squares which I know sounds ridiculous but trust me um, you need to be able to do it okay so let's count the squares together uh, right I've got one two three four I'm going to count uh, mostly whole squares uh, five six seven whole squares and let's start to add up some extras i reckon this one here this one here and this one make eight and i reckon this one here and probably this one here and this one here make about nine so therefore i've got nine squares um, and you could have a little bit of leeway either way there's always a bit of uh, uh, leeway with any sort of involving a graph um, so nine squares in total and I would always write down the fact you're working out the area just so uh, your marker knows that's what you're doing. Um, now, what is each square worth? Well, if you go along this way, you've got one second in this direction. If you go up this way, you've got five meters per second in this direction, okay? So each square, um, if you were to multiply them together, one second in this way, five uh, meters per second that way, each square um, is equal to one times five equals five meters. So therefore we've got nine of them so nine times by five equals 45 meters overall so that's going to be our breaking distance down the bottom here now um, there's leeway i think you can go from 42 to around 50 for this depending on how many squares you counted um, but the important bit to note is that you have to use this method okay you can't just do one calculation uh, let's flip over the page, have a look at the remainder of the question. Um, the question says, explain how the gradient of a line, the resultant force on the grinder, just to save me flicking back and forward, uh, the graph looks a bit like this. It's not constant, it's a curved line. So how does it show uh, that the force on it isn't constant? Now, you might be thinking it's a bit weird to have force. There's no force on this graph anyway, but we've got to be able to know what the gradient of this of a velocity time graph represents. Okay, now the gradient of a velocity time graph, you get in doubt, look at your equation sheet. Gradient is the change in y, which is velocity divided by the change in x, which is time. Okay, so the gradient for a velocity time graph is equal to acceleration. So we get a mark for writing that down. So let's just write that down straight away. So the gradient of uh, the graph is equal to acceleration. And that then gives us a clue into how we can talk about force because there is a link between force and acceleration if you look at your equation sheet. From our equation sheet, we should notice that there is a very famous equation. Newton's second law says that F equals M times A, or you could say force is proportional to acceleration, assuming mass is constant, which it is, because uh, it's a car. Okay. So what we then say is that the gradient changes, or is not constant. And then you'd say, so force uh, is not constant 
constant. And the explanation would be one of these two, you can take your pick. Uh, I'm gonna say because force is proportional to acceleration here. Okay, so those are my three bits there. The bit in the middle is just a bit of explanation um, for our velocity time graph question. But make sure you revise velocity time graphs and distance time graphs um, because they could both come up in some form in paper too. Okay, uh, we've got another uh, graph here. This one's a distance time graph. Uh, I'm sorry, beg your pardon, distance speed graph, which is a bit unusual. And the information this graph gives us is as speed increases, what happens to thinking distance? So this question could come up um, higher tier. Um, on separate or combined um, science. Um, and it's kind of a fundamental skill. It could come up in any other context. All right, it's a really important question to get your head around. Uh, it'll be one of the harder ones in the paper, uh, but once you understand how to do it, I promise it will be uh, a little bit easier if you get one of these in the exam. So the context of the question is that um, there's a current in a wire and there's a force that acts on it. Okay, I'm not gonna go through this part of the question, uh, but essentially you've got a scale and you've got a wire going through it, and it's basically an example of the motor effect, okay? But for this part of the question, all we're looking at um, is a calculation aspect that involves a graph. And the graph shows us how the force uh, in newtons uh, varies with current um, applied. So they give us the wire and they ask us to determine the magnetic flux density. Okay, so there's only one equation that's got magnetic flux density in it. So that's going to be the first thing we're going to write down. Okay, uh, now often with these questions, when we're asked to use this equation, we've got given three values and we're trying to find a third. However, we've got the length but we, there's lots of different values for current and there's lots of different values for force. So we're gonna have to figure out, well, do I use one value or do I use multiple? Uh, how am I gonna work out the flux density? And what we've gotta do is actually use all of them. We're gonna use the line of best fit, okay? Now the whole point in taking graphs in science is so that we get more reliable results, more accurate results by using a line of best fit effectively and average, okay? So in this case, what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna use the gradient of the line. Okay, let me get my ruler. Um, so we're gonna use the gradient of the line to be able to work out, well, uh, something about the magnetic flux density, okay? Now, gradient is obviously a change in y divided by change in x. Now, our change in y axis is the force, so that's F. Change in x is current, uh, which we use the symbol I. So essentially, the gradient is gonna be equal to force divided by current, okay? Now, how do we kind of link that into our equation here? Well, actually, if I rearrange this whole thing, which I know normally I don't do, but you do have to in this case, for flux density, I've got F over here, and I pull across these things, divide by them over here, okay? I can see I've got F on top and I've got current on bottom, okay? So actually what I'm gonna to have to do is essentially say, well, force divide by current, Okay, that's giving me my gradient. All I need to do is then factor in the value for the length of wire, and that's gonna give me my magnetic flux density. Okay, so we'll talk about the length at the end, um, but let's work out the gradient first of all. So um, the way I've done it here, um, I'm gonna, so um, the way I've done it here, um, I'm gonna do my gradient calculation over on this side. Uh, I actually realizing the way I should have done it, it's probably the whole triangle, but it should make a difference. The straight line should be the same value. So this value up here is 0 0.021. Um, this value here is 0 0.005. And on the bottom, I've got this value is 0 0.7. And this value over here is um, 0 0.18. Okay, so let's shut those all into a calculator and see what we get. So that's equal to 0.307 and lots of decimal places on the end, okay? Now I'm gonna use that. Now that's my first block job done. That's the majority of the marks for this question. Um, but we've then got divide by the length. Now length is just a constant value. So therefore for flux density, I'm gonna use the gradient 0.307 um, divide by uh, 0.125. And if I stick that into my calculator, uh, it comes to 0.246. Um, which um, I'm going to round to 0.25, uh, but it would be fine to leave it. Uh, it doesn't mention significant figures in this question. Um, so there we go. So the general principle here, and it could come up in a few different situations, could come up in paper one as well, that if you've got values on a y and x axis, make sure you can put them into an equation and use the gradient or some of the area of a line to work out something um, that you're trying to find out. Another uh, graph here, this one's a distance time graph. Uh, I'm sorry, beg your pardon, distance speed graph, which is a bit unusual. And the information this graph gives us is as speed increases, what happens to thinking distance, braking distance, and overall stopping distance of a vehicle? 
And this question asks us to describe the relationship shown uh, in figure nine. Uh, and it is a very scary six marks, okay? Uh, so the relationships we are talking about were thinking distance, breaking distance, and stopping distance. And it also says you should include factors that would affect the gradient of the line. Don't forget gradient is essentially how steep the line is. So just to have an initial look, um, the kind of solid line here, our thinking distance, here's a constant gradient, and the other two both start to curve up. They have an increasing gradient um, with increasing speed. Um, so let's have a look at what kind of things we could talk about in this question. Now the easiest thing to talk about is the first um, line that's um, kind of solid line which is thinking distance. Okay, um, So we can do it in bullet points because uh, we always can do a six mark questions um, about uh, the relationship first of all. Now it goes through the origin and it's a straight line so that shows us oh. that for um, thinking distance the speed um, is directly proportional to thinking distance. Okay, So speed is directly proportional to um, so uh, well to distance basically overall okay now the reason for that uh, if you want to put in a bit of extra detail is that distance equals speed times by um, time um, so those two things the speed and the distance uh, assuming the time is constant um, are going to affect each other linearly okay so uh, distance goes up when speed goes up Okay, so factors that affect them, this should be these bits, uh, quite a nice thing to revise this for paper two, um, is that thinking distance uh, is um, increased by or affected by um, things like uh, distractions, uh, whether someone's intoxicated, so alcohol, consumption, uh, tiredness, etc. Okay. That's your first one, that's thinking distance. Let's talk about uh, the next line, which is breaking distance, before we look at stopping distance overall. So breaking distance, um, as we mentioned earlier, is not directly proportional. Breaking distance curves upwards like this, okay? So we can talk about factors in a second, um, but the breaking distance is proportional to the speed squared, okay? And I'll explain this in a second because uh, you couldn't be able to necessarily tell that from the graph without taking lots of data. Um, but the idea is this, okay, because um, the when someone is braking, uh, the um, speed is not constant, okay, so we can't then assume those two things are proportional. Um, and the equation we could use to describe it is this really confusing, uh, horrible super equation, um, which is um, that if you have speed squared, distance, okay, assuming it's a constant acceleration, those two things will be proportional to each other, okay? So then S is proportional to the speed squared. It's a bit of extra detail there, okay? Um, all right, so two things then uh, we could talk about um, is that uh, what the factors are. So it's increased by none of those factors above, um, but it's increased by um, poor um, brake conditions, like brake or tire conditions. Uh, you could talk about wet or icy roads. I wouldn't just say road condition, I'd say, well, what condition are they in? Um, and things like that. There's a lot of tough stuff you talk about there, okay? Now, the one thing I haven't mentioned yet, which is that speed comes into both categories. So speed is affecting um, the braking distance and the thinking distance, okay, um, uh, in a um, similar way, okay? Um, right, and last of all is stopping distance. Well, what is that effective? Um, so stopping distance, we should know is made up of thinking distance added to braking distance. So the two factors added together. And you can actually tell that from the graph. If you looked at particular values, um, you could figure out that this is made up of this plus this. Uh, we don't need to for this question. Okay, so because it's made up of both those things added together, um, then you could say, I'm just gonna go down here. So factors affecting thinking and braking affect stopping distance. thinking and breaking distance affect stopping distance okay um, and overall how you describe this graph well, it's not a squared graph because um, it's not going to be um, uh, just made up of breaking distance uh, but we'd say the stopping distance um, increases at an increasing rate basically it's a good way of describing it And that's how you go about um, describing that uh, question. I hope you found that useful. Um, and don't forget, make sure you've revised all the motion graphs uh, for your paper two physics uh, exam.